And so here's what's going to happen this morning. Get your Bibles ready. Uh, we're going to be all over the place. And so get your Bibles ready to, to move around. The Scripture will, of course, be on the screen if you're here with us or joining us by live stream either way. Max Licato writes of this Christmas season, especially of the birth of Jesus, this way. He says, he, speaking of Jesus, swapped a spotless castle for a grimy stable. He exchanged the worship of angels for the company of killers. He could hold the universe in his palm, but he gave it up to float in the womb of a virgin. If you were God, would you sleep on straw, nurse from a breast, and be clothed in a diaper? Christ did. If you knew that only a few would even care that you had ever come, would you still come? If you knew that those who, those who you loved would laugh in your face, would you still care? If you knew that the tongues you made would mock you, the mouths you made would spit at you, the hands you made would crucify you, would you still make them? Christ did. Heaven and earth knows no greater love than God's personal love for you and your relationship with Him. You see, this is exactly how God's love had to enter the world in order that Jesus might save sinners, rebels like you, like me, by becoming one of us, yet without sin, so that He could be our perfect substitute and Savior. I've been thinking a lot in preparation for today's message about a, a song that some of you may be familiar with called Fully Known by Tar and Wells. It's a little... Um, R&B, if you will, on, as far as the genre, so I didn't play it for you this morning. Some of you wouldn't appreciate that, but the words are amazing. It's so unusual, it's frightening. He's addressing God. You see right through the mess inside me, and you call me out to pull me in. You tell me I can start again, and I don't need to keep on hiding. I'm fully known and loved by you. You won't let go no matter what I do, and it's not one or the other. It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known, and loved by you. I'm fully known and loved by you. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find the reasons why you gave me so much. It's so like you to keep pursuing and so like me to go astray. Oh, but you guard my heart with your truth, the kind of love that's bulletproof, and I surrender to your kindness, fully known and fully loved. I'm just going to tell you straight up, beginning of this message, here's the deal. My goal is to call every heart under the sound of my voice that hears this message to surrender to the kindness, the loving heart of my Father. That's what I want for you. That's why I came this morning, so that you can know Him as your Father this Christmas. We're going to talk about this morning this simple reality. Christ came to bring you amazing love. The gifts that we all need after 2020. You heard it in my prayer. We always need this. Especially after this year, we need hope. We need peace. We need joy. But all that grows out of the reality that Christ came to bring you amazing love. Love. And here's the take home truth. What's Advent about? Advent is God the Father running to you in amazing love through the incarnation of God the Son. Advent is about God the Father running to you in amazing love through the incarnation of God the Son. I hope you'll get that by the time I'm done and we're done here together this morning. John 3 16 is a great place to jump off into the love of God, where Jesus himself says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, we talked about this last Sunday. We, had, we, we actually were in John 3, 16 last Sunday. Fancy that. Christmas time and God giving His Son. 
the text here, for God so loved the world. Sometimes we, we think about that in terms of, 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 of how much God loved the world, and there's some truth in that. But, but there's also in this, in this Greek word translated here, so, some of your translations, I think the NIV may say, for God in this way loved the world. In other words, it wasn't just a feeling, it was an action. God in this way loved the world that he gave his son. And you see, God gave his son in the incarnation that night in Bethlehem, amen? In order that he might give Jesus in the crucifixion. He gave his son in the incarnation in order that he might give him in the crucifixion. All because of his great love for us. He gave him when he sent him out of heaven and Christ voluntarily, you know, in perfect and in, in grateful obedience to the Father, left the glories of heaven, and became a man. Just imagine, you're the creator of all things. John says, it's by Christ, by the word that all things were created, and that one, that's who you are, you become an unborn baby in the womb of the Virgin Mary. What humility. What love is this. Advent is God the Father running to you in amazing love through the incarnation of God the Son? And they say, well, how's God the Father run to me through God the Son? Well, you, let's just assume something, get this clear. We, we believe in something called the Trinity. That is, there's one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Those aren't three gods. That's one God in three persons. You say, Chad, that doesn't make any sense. Of course it doesn't. It's God. But Scripture makes it clear that's exactly who He is. And so... God the Son and God the Father, while distinct persons are one and, 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 and the same God. Advent is God the Father running to you in amazing love through the incarnation of God the Son. Uh, 1 John 4, 9 and 10 comes to mind is, and is, is maybe even clearer than John three sixteen about how this works. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world. When did He do that? When did He arrive? He arrived nine months before he was born into the world, amen? He was in the womb of the, of the virgin for nine months. He was born in a little town called Bethlehem. He was laid there, probably not, by the way, in a wooden manger. I've, I've been to Bethlehem. There's not a lot of wood around. There's, 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 the trees are kind of scarce. There's a lot of sandstone, and usually what they fed their animals out of, what we would call a manger, is a, is a, is a rock thing. It's a stone piece that they burrowed out and, and made the place for the hay. And so Jesus most likely laying in that. That's when he came into the world, that we might live through him. He wouldn't just be born, though. He would grow and become a man. He would perfectly keep the law in your place. And then he would go to the cross and die of the death you deserved under the curse of the law for all the many sins that you and I have committed. He would, he would die. He was graveyard dead for three days. But on the third day, he rose again in victory, which proved that the price was paid, that it really was valid, that, his, that salvation had been purchased and today he lives as the only Savior of the world. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Understand this. You didn't start Christmas. Mankind didn't initiate Christmas. God initiated Christmas. You know the call that God never got from humanity? God never got the call, hey God, we're in trouble down here, can you send a Savior? He never got that call. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us. You know what humanity would have done? You know what all of us would have done? If God hadn't sent His Son of His own sovereign and gracious and loving initiative, we would have continued to be God-haters. We would have continued to rebel and, and, and live either in, 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 in outright uh, just... just uh, loose living and, 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 and open sin or, or, or smug self-righteousness about how good we were. But we would never have called on heaven and asked for a Savior. And yet, even though we haven't loved God, He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. More about what that means in just a moment. David Mathis put it this way, The Word made flesh coming without a cross in view is no good news. The Christmas story without the cross, if Bethlehem wasn't headed to Golgotha, it was a waste. There's no good news there. 
It's just another birth of another Jewish baby in an out-of-the-way place. The light and joy of Christmas are hollow at best if we sever the link between the manger and the cross. The manger is for all sinners because the cross is for all sinners. You see, Christmas is ultimately about Good Friday. Amen? Christmas, the birth of Christ, is ultimately about His death in our place on Good Friday. The manger is ultimately about the cross. And hear me, the manger and Christmas have no meaning without the cross, without Golgotha, without three days dead and Him raised from the dead. Christ was born to die for our sins, to bring us the love of God while we were still sinners, condemned and hopeless before His holiness. Leslie just sang that song, The Light of the World by Lauren Daigle, written by Lauren Daigle, and, and that one line there, a baby's cry is the sound of love. Do you get it? When Jesus cried in that manger, what made that meaningful was not it was, oh, cute and sweet. It, it was this baby that would become the man who would go to the cross and die for you and for me and pay the price for all of our sins, all of them, past, present, and future, forever. So that it could be declared of us, even as Paul would say it, there is therefore now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. The Prince of Peace has come. So what did he do? Let me just give you a, a quick rundown of the gospel. I want you to know Jesus if you don't know him today. Did you catch that? That's what I want you to meet, who I want you to meet during this message is Jesus. I want you to leave here knowing Christ and being fully lo known and, and yet loved, knowing that you're loved by God. Romans 5 verse 8 says that God shows his love for us in that. How? In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You understand, before I was ever born in 19, September of 1971, way back 2,000 years ago, Jesus came and lived a perfect life in my place. He went to the cross, and he died on the cross for me. He knew me before I was ever born, the Scriptures teach. And he paid the price for me, and he paid the price for you. God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, For our sake He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him, God the Son, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What an amazing exchange has taken place through, through, through the substitution, substitutionary life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God the Father. Here's what happened. Why did He send Jesus? So that He can make Jesus who was perfect and sinless, to be sin for us. What does that mean? That means when he was on the cross, Peter, 1 Peter 2 says that in his own body, he bore in his own body our sins on that tree. God, it would say, as, as, as the prophet Isaiah would say in Isaiah 53, God laid on him the iniquity of us all. The sin of all of us was laid on Jesus there on the cross. And in that moment... As our substitute, God the Father made Jesus the Son to be sin, who was perfect in and of himself, so that in Jesus we, who were unrighteous, might become the righteousness of God. And because of the death of Jesus in our place, because of his perfect life, listen to what I'm fixing to tell you, this is amazing. Because of his death on the cross for our sins, because of his perfect life in our place, listen to this. We can become the righteousness of God in Him. What does that mean? That means we can stand before holy God and be seen by God the Father just as righteous as God the Son. When you trust Jesus, that's what happens. And it's amazing. I mean, let me just tell you something. If, if that ever gets old to you, if you ever get over that, then, then you may not be saved. And I'm dead serious when I say that. Like, you can't get over the fact that God, holy God, would see me as righteous as Jesus. Are you kidding me? I know I'm not. But you know what God said? God said, Jesus took your sin and he paid for it. No, no, no double jeopardy with the perfect judge of all things. No second payment by me. Jesus paid it all. 
And he lived perfectly in my place. And God took all of his righteousness and put it in Chad Kelly's spiritual and eternal bank account and said, you will always be seen as perfect as the son, my son who died for you and in whose robe you were clothed. And that's what Christmas is about. You ain't going to get nothing like that Friday morning. Hallelujah, huh? I mean, Santa can bring some good stuff, but he, I mean, he don't compare to that. Romans 3, man, I could, I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying, fix and read three verses and I could spend a while right here. Romans 3, verse 23, Paul says, for all have sinned. See, so what I want to make clear to you about this whole, everything we're talking about today, it, it, it it includes everybody, every human ever born anywhere on the planet, period. Y'all with me? For all have sinned except Jesus, right? That's why he can be the Savior, by the way. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, when you sin and fall short of the glory of God over in Romans in another place, Paul says the wages of sin is what? Death. That doesn't just mean you die and we bury your body. That means your soul dies the second death. You're forever dead in a place called, real place called hell where the wrath of God is eternally poured out on you and your, your soul is literally tormented forever. Is anybody interested in that? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, we are under the wrath of a just and holy God. But here's the good news. But here's how we're justified. And are justified. That means to be declared righteous before God. We've already talked about that part. And are justified by His grace, the Father's grace. Look look at it. This, this sounds pretty Christmassy, doesn't it? As a gift. <laughs> As a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The way we're declared righteous before holy God is that God in His grace gives us this gift. There was a price paid. That that gift was bought through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Jesus paid it all for you. He purchased your righteousness. He purchased your forgiveness. And now He says to you, all you got to do is by faith come and take it. Just like a kid with his grandpa. Did you ever pay to try to pay your grandpa for a Christmas present? Huh? No. I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, there, there's, there's some weirdos, but I mean, surely you didn't, right? If you did, your grandpa said, are you kidding me, honey? I mean, right? He would have got on to you. Why? It's Christmas. I'm grandpa. I'm giving you a gift. Don't make any mistake. God's not grandpa. He doesn't just wink at your sin. He sent his son to die for it. Very different than your grandpa, amen? Holy and just and yet still just as tenderly compassionate and merciful as he can be. And yet he's paid the price through his son to give you salvation as a gift. Listen, whom God, speaking of Jesus, Jesus paid it all through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. It's a repetition here in one sense, but it's an extension also. The word propitiation is a hugely important word. Every, and I mean this when I say this, every single church member... If you name the name of Jesus, you need to do a word study on the word propitiation. You need to understand what that word means. It's that important. It could be one of the most important biblical words in all of Scripture. And here's what it means. It means that God did not just dismiss, like your grandpa would, your sin and sweep it under the rug, just forget it ever happened. We're just going to let that go. No, no. What propitiation means is that the full and holy wrath and justice of God. God's got to be just, does he not? What do you do with a God that's not just? What do you do with a God that doesn't call sin, sin, and punish it? I mean, that's just a wreck. That's just a grandpa, right? That's a fairy tale. God has to punish sin, and the word propitiation means he has, and he did it through the bloodletting of Jesus, the life-giving death of Christ, where he poured out his life, and all of God's wrath against my sin and yours fell on him. We've already said this, but understand it. And in that death, the full wrath of God toward my sins forever was satisfied. That's what propitiation means. It was all poured out on him. All poured out on him. 
it was all poured out on him. I, I keep saying that two or three times right there because you know what? Even as Christians, sometimes we have a hard time believing that it really was all. All my sin was paid for, punished in the death of Christ. And yet it was. And the wrath of God, the justice of a holy God toward my sin, fully satisfied. That's the, what the word propitiation means. And it was accomplished by his blood. So what do you got to do? <laughs> the gift's been prepared. The gift's been offered by grace so that all you have to do is receive it by faith. Will you? You see, this is the love of God. This is why Jesus was born of a virgin and laid in Bethlehem in a Bethlehem feeding trough. Do you? Do you know the love of God in Jesus by personal faith in Him? Have you trusted Jesus as Savior and surrendered your heart to this loving Master? Have you taken the gift that He is offering? Advent is God the Father running to you in amazing love through the incarnation of God the Son. This is amazing love, is it not? That continues to blow me away day by day, and it stirs my heart to sing one of my favorite hymns, Joe, in all the world and, and, and that I've ever known and ever had the privilege to sing, and I'm not fixing to sing Mike either. But it stirs my heart to sing to God and of God's love. So I'm just going to read you the, the lyrics to And Can It Be by Charles Wesley. Old hymn, hundreds of years old. Listen to this. And can it be? It's a question. That I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued with my sin? Amazing love. How can it be that thou my God shouldst die for me? He left his Father's throne above. Here's Christmas. You, you, you hear it? He left his Father's throne above. So free, so infinite his grace. Emptied himself of all but love and bled. For Adam's helpless race, tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. Do you remember that day you first trusted Jesus, do you? Raise your hand if you, if you remember when you trusted Christ. Remember that first time you understood what he did for you? Listen to this next verse. Long Does this describe that your experience? It, it, it does. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. On that day, thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke. The dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Man, what a day that was when God gave us eyes to see. Amen? No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Amazing love. How can it be? That thou, my God, shouldst die for me. That's, that's weak. Thank God for Michael back there. Amen? I mean, it's a shouting ground. Where are y'all at? Are y'all listening? Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Can you sing that? Is that the song of your heart this morning? One of my favorite stories in Scripture just drives home this truth that Advent is God the Father running to you in love through the incarnation of God the Son. One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture is the story of the prodigal son. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 15. It'll also be on the screen. At the beginning of Luke 15, verses 1 and 2 go like this. Luke is just recording kind of what was going on in the moment and, and telling us kind of the context for this most, uh, one, of the, one of my most favorite stories. But in Luke 15, 1, it says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, that is Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, so you got the tax collectors and the sinners, you know, all the bad people in the world, the, the, the low lowlifes, the ones that are really bad over here. And then you've got the Pharisees and the scribes. Uh, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. They're tore up. Who is this guy? Nobody can be really taking this guy serious. I mean, I mean, look at him. He, he's, not, he's not a real religious leader. Look at him. He's, he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. sinners. He's eating with the, the riffraff. He's, he's eating with all those unrighteous and ungodly people, not people like us. Look at this guy. He receives sinners and eats with them. Well, Jesus responds to that, beginning in verse 3, with a series of three stories. Uh, one is the story about the lost sheep. The second one's the story about the lost coin. And the third is the, the most famous and one of my favorite stories, the story of the lost son, right? The prodigal son, the story has often been called. 
And what Jesus does in those three back-to-back stories, I mean, I mean, don't miss this, it was rapid fire. Boom, boom, boom. What's my response to your words, you Pharisees and scribes? What's my, what's my response to this statement that this man receives sinners and eats with them? Let me tell you what my response is, Jesus said. My response, it's seen in these three stories, is this. Not only do I receive sinners, I want you to understand, I go way past receive sinners. Y'all ain't even close to the scandal of grace. I don't just receive sinners, hear me, I go looking for sinners. Hallelujah. Amen. I go looking for sinners. When there's one sheep lost, I leave 99 to go after that one. When there's one coin out of my piggy bank that rolls up under the couch, I move the furniture, I rearrange the house, I find the lost coin. And then this story, picking it up in Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. By the way, we're not going to get to the second son tonight, today. Um, come back Christmas Eve. We're going to revisit this Christmas Eve. So may, maybe, maybe we'll get to the second son then. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. I understand how offensive that was. To the father. Basically, it, it, it'd be something like this. Here's the deal. I want my inheritance. You know, that's something you get when after your father dies. So basically, dad, I kind of wish you were already dead because I want the money now. You're not dead, so can you just give me? I mean, that's really why I'm still into a relationship with you is because I just want your stuff. So the father does. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. By the way, that's where we get the the term the prodigal son, reckless living, prodigal living, reckless, all out there living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed who? Who? Pigs. Jesus is talking to Jews. Things just got real bad. Things are lower than low. This Jewish man has not only left and squandered his whole, left, left his father's house and squandered his whole inheritance and ended up in poverty, but he's he's feeding pigs that Jews did not touch or eat. And he was longing to be fed with the pies that the pigs ate, and no one gave him. Anything. Here's the truth. You can always be sure of sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay. And it'll, it'll make you pay far more than you ever intended to pay. Sin never gives you life. It only brings death. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, here's what I'm going to tell him. I know I've messed it up. I can't be his son anymore. That's over, but I'm going to tell him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. At least if he'll just hire me, I can live and have a better life than I've got in the depths of sin. And he arose and came to his father. Listen to this. Whew. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he had been feeling that compassion ever since he left. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the idea is here, I mean, he, he, I mean, he kissed him a lot. An old man just smacking all over this boy. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Remember, just like, he's, he, just like he'd rehearsed, I'm no longer, to be, longer worthy to be called your son. Just like he rehearsed, except there was more he was supposed to say, right? What was the next thing he was going to say? So just hire me like a servant. The father doesn't even let him finish. And it says, but the father said to his servants... 
Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate. I wonder if there's church members in this place today who relate to God like God's hired you to do a job for Him. You've never actually been at the place where you related to God as your Father. You know what an insult that is to Him? He is the Father who runs to the prodigal and embraces Him and calls Him Son. Not slave. Are we servants of the King? Yes, all that's true. But get this picture. Don't miss this point. While he was still a long way off, the father saw him and felt compassion and ran. Understanding that day, older men didn't run. They were distinguished. They they didn't have to run. I mean, it's kind of still true, isn't it? (laughs) Uh, Huh, guys? (laughs) I mean, (laughs) when's the last time some of you boys ran? I mean, it's been a while for me. I mean, we get other boys to run, don't we? We get the young ones to run if they need running to be done. Wasn't dignified. He didn't care. You understand, if anybody in the universe needs to run, it ain't God. Hello? And yet this picture is of God running to you. Running to you. He's in a hurry to get to you. He's urgently wanting to be with you. That's what He wants. And when he gets to you, just because you started coming, you didn't even get all the way to the house. He wraps you up, he kisses you, he embraces you, and he calls you son. Calls you daughter. Puts the best robe on you. By the way, I'm not saying that's what Jesus meant in this text, but there is a passage in one of Paul's letters where he talks about us being clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. He's given us his best robe. His own son is our righteousness. That'll preach a whole other sermon, but we'll keep going. Advent is God the Father running to you in love through the incarnation of God the Son. Back in 1985, Joe, stay with me on this. Some of you were alive. Some of you are too little and young to remember this, but there was a song written by a guy named Benny Hester, and I didn't actually come to know this song when Benny Hester wrote it and sang it. Freddie, you were around. (laughs) Some years later, this is where I came into the picture in in knowledge of this song, Phillips, Craig, and Dean recorded this song. The song is called When God Ran. Listen to it. This, this, This is a good commentary on this whole message. It's a good commentary on Luke 15. Listen to what the song says. Almighty God, the great I am. Remember who he is. Immovable rock, omnipotent, powerful, awesome Lord. This is our God. Victorious warrior, commanding king of kings, mighty conqueror. And the only time, the only time I ever saw him run was when he ran to me. He took me in his arm, held my head to his chest, said, My son's come home again, lifted my face, wiped the tears from my eyes with forgiveness in his voice. He said, Son, do you know I still love you? He caught me by surprise when God ran. The day I left home, I knew I'd broken his heart, and I wondered then if things could ever be the same. Then one night, I remembered his love for me, and down that dusty road ahead, I could see It was the only time, it was the only time I ever saw him run. And then he ran to me. He took me in his arms, held my head to his chest, said, My sons, come home again. Lifted my face, wiped the tears from my eyes, and with forgiveness in his voice, he said, Son, do you know I still love you? He caught me by surprise. And he brought me to my knees. When I, when God ran, I saw him run to me. I was so ashamed, all alone, and so far away, but now I know that he's been waiting for this day. 
That's how your father feels about you. Maybe this morning you've heard this message and you're thinking right now in this moment, you're thinking, I can't believe this. I've never heard this. I didn't know God was like that. He caught, he's catching you by surprise right now. Let him wrap you up in his arms of grace and love. Take the free gift of forgiveness and righteousness in Christ that he's offering you today. Because you see, Advent is God the Father running to you in love through the incarnation of his Son. Christmas is God running into human history to save you, to save me. Don't miss it, running. Have you seen God running in love to embrace you and call you his son? My prayer today for each of you, those of you who have trusted Christ and those of you who have not yet trusted Christ is that according to Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, this is, this is my prayer for you, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, you know, if you're a believer today, you, you, you're already rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. You've already been planted in the soil of the grace of God. You've you're, you got a foundation of His love, right? If you're here this morning or watching this morning and, and you've not yet trusted, today can be the day that you become rooted and grounded in the love of God. By simple faith in Him. Just trust Him. Take, it, take Him in His Word. Believe what we've been talking about. And the Bible says, if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. So my prayer for all of you is that being rooted and grounded in love, you may have strength to comprehend, listen, with all the saints. See, this is actually a prayer for the church. And we apparently need this, or Paul wouldn't have put it in here, right? Brothers and sisters, that we would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. The problem is we don't comprehend what is the length and height and breadth and depth and all the, all the measurements of the bigness of God's love. And to know the love of Christ, not just with your head but with your heart, that surpasses knowledge. Paul says, I want you to know what you can't know. I want you to understand what you'll never understand. I want you to be growing in the knowledge of something that you can never fully get, even for all of eternity, such as the riches of his love, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's my prayer for you. Church family, brothers and sisters in Christ visiting with us or watching online, my exhortation to you is the church additionally comes from Jude 20 and 21 where uh, it says, but you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, listen to this. Here's your job. Messages like this are helpful, but here's your responsibility. It's on you. It's on me. Keep yourselves in God's love. Now, does that mean we've got to keep ourselves saved? Anybody real quick? That's a simple question. No, of course not. God did it all. Jesus paid it all. Uh, salvation is through and through, by grace, through faith in him. But what it does mean is I have to keep myself in remembrance of the love of Christ. Amen? I needed that Paul, prayer of Paul's in Ephesians 3. I need someone to be praying for me that I'll know just how big the love of Christ is every day. That in my experience, I'm not forgetting the love of Christ, but I'm remembering it. And I'm keeping myself right in the center of God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you eternal life. Simply put, every day, it's on you. It's on me preach the gospel to myself you get it keep yourself in the love of god the love of christ for there's nothing you need more than to keep yourself in god's love moment by moment day by day advent is the is god the father running to you in love through the incarnation of god the son and because he did listen to me we're wrapping up romans 8 31 to 39 is true for you who know jesus Paul says, what then shall we say to these things? I mean, if this is true, if God the Father has run to you in amazing love through the incarnation of Jesus' Son, then what shall we say about that? Well, Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? If God's done that for us, we're good. Can't nobody mess with us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things, not all things that we want, but all things that we need? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who? Who? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure, I am sure, are you sure, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you understand Christmas that way? Advent is the Father, God the Father running to you in love through the incarnation of the Son, God the Son. Let's pray together.